I am Professor Collins, and this is your Daily Dose of Statistics. So today we will be going over inferential statistics. And so this begins a series of, uh, of, of talks on understanding inference. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over an introduction to infer inferential statistics, some estimation procedures, uh, which include confidence intervals, then we'll be going over hypothesis testing one and discussing one sample cases. And then hypothesis, hypothesis testing two, where we'll be talking about two sample cases. Um, so this lecture in particular, we will be going over an introduction to inferential statistics. So we will be talking about sampling procedures and sampling distribution. Before we jump into that, let's get uh, in touch with a few definitions. Um, these definitions are fairly important and will carry throughout this, uh, this lecture. So first, central limit theorem. Central limit theorem is the idea that, uh, it, that it specifies the mean standard deviation and shape of a sampling distribution given that the sample is large. And so what central limit theorem essentially says is that as samples become larger, the shape of a sample distribution becomes more normalized. And what that means is that the shape of the distribution will, um, when the sample becomes larger, it will be such that the mean, median, mode are fairly in the middle um, and the standard deviations are standardized across the sample. And so the idea here is that as our sample become large, becomes larger, the distribution will become more normalized. Simple random sample, and we'll talk about this in more detail. Uh, this is a method for choosing cases within a population where every single case has an equal chance of being selected. Non-probability sample um, is any sample does, that does not mean EP, meet EPSEM criteria. And so what that means is, is that when you're choosing your sample from the larger population, each individual doesn't have an equal chance, or each case doesn't have an equal chance of being selected. Um, so you're selecting your cases, um, not based on probability, but based on some other criteria, based on convenience, for example, um, or based on some other criteria. Cluster sampling is a method of sampling uh, using geographic units or some cluster of, or some group um, to sample your cases. And then the cases are randomly sampled within those geographic units, typically. Um, this can also be done with classrooms, for example, or other, um, other situations where you have some sort of natural clustering going on. Uh, and then a representative sample is a sample that reproduces the characteristics of interest of the population for which it's drawn, for which it is drawn. So um, re representative sample is sort of, uh, sort of self-explanatory. Your sample represents the characteristics of your population. And EPSEM is the Equal Probability of Selection Method for selecting samples. And what this, what this does is it states that each, each element um, must have an equal opportunity to be chosen for the sample. Um, so each element meaning um, some particular characteristic of your population. So let's get into sampling procedures. Um, so we'll be talking about simple, simple random sampling, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling. So first, let's dig into simple random sampling. Now, simple random sampling is, is such that each case is selected completely at random, and each case in the population has an equal chance or equal probability of being selected um, within the sample. So let's just do a sample, um, just, a, just an example on, um, say we want to do a study on household income. And we have 40 different households, right? And so what we want to do is we want to randomly sample each of these 40 households with the idea that if we get enough randomization in here, um, the, the, the sample will represent the full population characteristic of household income, right? So what that means is the, the central tendency should be the same and the variability should be relatively similar. 
And so say we want 25% of our entire population, right? So we want 10 households um, to represent all 40 of our households. What we can do is we can do something like um, use it using Excel, we could do something like have a random number generator. Um, and we can use that random number generator to, to randomly select our households, right? And so what we could do is we can generate random numbers and say put them in order. Um, we, can, we can sort them in order uh, and then pick the top, say, 10 cases, right? And so what we do here is now we can randomly select our households based on a random number generator, right? So we can select 10 households out of our entire sample and, or excuse me, out of the entire population and these 10 households are um, intended to represent the entire population of all 40 houses, even though we didn't select 40 of them, we only selected 25%. Systematic random sampling now is, is slightly different than simple random sampling. Systematic random sampling occurs uh, when the first case is randomly selected, but then every case, every kth case um, is selected afterwards, and k is a, a random number, right? So it could be every tenth case, every ninth case, every 100th case, right? And this is nice when you're working with populations that are really, really large. Um, and the idea here is that if you randomly select the first case and then randomly select um, the interval in between those cases, um, then you should have a fairly decent random sample of the entire population. Um, this can be helpful. This, this often occurs um, in opinion surveys, for example, where pollsters or people who are conducting opinion surveys, say, on the street, will randomly select every, say, 50th person that walks by, right? So this is the idea that um, every 50th person represents kind of the, the entirety, the, the whole population. So again, let's take a study on household income. We have our uh, 40 houses and we're, we're interested um, in uh, the, the household income across these 40 houses. And again, we go to our random number generator and what we see here is that randomly, um, I ra what I did here is I, I randomly generated some numbers and then I sorted them um, with the highest number being on the top. Um, and that's the, the column B there. And what I find is household 13 is the first household that comes up. So what we'll do is we've randomly selected now household 13, so we'll start with household 13. And then we will uh, we'll, we'll sample house 13 and then sample every fourth house, right? So we have house 17, house 21, house 25, uh, house 29, house 33, and house 37, right? And so what you see here is every, every ninth house, or excuse me, every fourth house is being selected. So that is our systematic random sampling. Um, now let's talk about stratified random sampling. Stratified random sampling, of course, is a, is a little bit different. What we do here is we split the population into re relevant traits uh, and then randomly sample from the sub subpopulation according to those traits. Um, and proportion should be equal according to subpopulation. Um, so the usefulness of this is when you're trying to um, do something, say, across race or ethnicity, where you're really being strategic about trying to integrate um, samples from a population or a subpopulation who may not be well rep represented in your particular location, for example. Um, so say we're trying to uh, gain data from, uh, from, from West Africans, right? And so um, that's a very specific subpopulation. So what we do is we split up the entire population based on that relative trait and then we will be very specific about sampling those particular traits. And so each subsample should be the same percentage in the sample as it is in the, in the total population. So if West Africans make up 1% of the entire population in say our city um, or in the population, then what we wanna do is make sure that they also represent 1% within our sample as well.
And so let's say we're studying household income um, by social economic status, right? It's a little bit redundant, um, but follow me here. And so say we have uh, four different classes, right? We have working class, um, we have lower class, middle class, and um, upper class. Uh, and so what we can do here is we can split up these different traits, right? We can split up these houses by those particular traits, and then we can start sampling by those traits, right? So we have our high income, low income, middle income, um, and working class, right? So we, we, have, um, we have each of these traits, and what we do is we specifically sample within those particular traits. Um, so that's the idea of, of stratified random sampling. Now we get to cluster sampling. Cluster, cluster sampling is similar to stratified ram, random sampling, um, except it's more geographic based or location based as opposed to uh, as opposed to trait based or characteristic based. So there's several steps here in in doing cluster sampling. Um, first, what you do is you identify all your possible clusters. Then what you do is randomly select clusters and then randomly select cases within each of those clusters. So let's think about a, a study of household income by neighborhood, for example. And again, we, we have our 40 houses here. But now, let's think about our houses as being split up in neighborhoods. And so each of these colors represents a different neighborhood. So say we only want to randomly select half of these neighborhoods, so we select three neighborhoods. So we randomly select those three neighborhoods, and then we randomly select houses within those neighborhoods. So now we can go through each neighborhood that we selected at random and start sampling houses within each of those neighborhoods. Right? So now you can see we have a random sample of both neighborhoods as well as a random sample of um, of houses within those neighborhoods. The issue here is oftentimes these are typically, these types of samples are typically less representative of the entire population. And as you can see here, um, there's a couple of neighborhoods there that are very homogenous or fairly homogenous, right? The, house, the households are fairly uh, similar to each other. And so if we have a neighborhood that is fairly homogenous and we randomly select that neighborhood and we randomly select out a neighborhood that is maybe more diverse, um, then we're missing some of that variation, right? So that's why it's typically less representative, because you're taking a sample of a sample. So those are our four basic sampling procedures, um, or more random sampling procedures, um, or probable sample sampling procedures. Now we, we, what we want to do is we want to talk about distributions. And so you're probably wondering, what's the, <clears throat> what's the importance of distributions, um, particularly for samples? And it's because the population distribution is typically unknown. In the social sciences, uh, we, we usually don't know the distribution, meaning we typically don't know the mean <clears throat> and the, the standard deviation, right? Or the central, te central tendency in distribution um, or dispersion. But um, what sampling can do is it can tell us the shape, central tendency, and dispersion of the, of, of the population distribution. It can give us some insight into that using sample data. And how it does that is through this idea of a sampling distribution. And what a sampling distribution is, using uh, the central uh, limit theorem, the idea is it, the sampling distribution is this theoretical distribution and it creates assumptions of shape, central tendency, and dispersion and uses those to estimate the parameters of the population based on the sample distribution. So basically what this is, is the idea is that the sample distribution um, uses these assumptions of the sampling distribution based on central limit theorem to estimate statistics or uh, what we call parameters to the population that we don't know about, right? And so let's just use this as an example. We have our normal distribution here, and let's just say this is the normal distribution of the population. Um, but let's say we don't know this, right? This is, the, let's just use this as an example. We don't necessarily know this. So what we can do is we can take 
a sample of the total population. And as you can see, this sample is sort of way off on the left tail. And so this may not particularly represent the entire population. However, as we get more samples, each sample has its own mean and its own standard deviation. And so what the sampling distribution, this theoretical distribution says, is the more samples we collect, the more likely it is to become the population, or represent the population distribution. Right, so we can collect more samples, more samples, and as you can see, most samples, means, and standard deviations are toward the middle, and fewer are off, to the, off into the tails, right? And so the idea here is that if we have a fairly representative sample, um, this sample can represent the population distribution. And what we can do is we can infer, hence the inferential statistics, we can infer what the population parameters are based on that sample, based on the data from the sample, based on sample distribution. So this is your introduction to inferential statistics. Um, we'll be building off of this, of course. Um, so think about your sampling procedures, think about distributions, and particularly when you're looking at um, science, scientific literature, scientific articles, when you're reading the news, right, when you're, when you're listening to the news, think about these sampling procedures because this is one way where uh, researchers and news sources can skew your data, right, or can skew not your data but their own data um, to fit their narrative, right, because if you're using a biased sample, your data is going to be biased, your distributions are going to be biased. Um, so think about that when you're reading um, newspapers and you're reading journals and stuff like that. All right, so um, next time we'll be going over estimation procedures and particularly confidence intervals. And um, we, we will keep going on inferential statistics. So um, that is your daily dose of statistics.